Okay, so coming back to uh, this example two, of course, we can finish up this double integral most quickly by just using the graphing calculator. Of course, a use substitution can be made very, very quickly to, to finish this up just as well. But uh, we're going to continue on to one more example. It's a very lengthy one. And it's going to tie into this last part of the notes on this page. Let's say that your surface is a finite union of other uh, smooth surfaces that intersect only along their boundaries. Uh, then what you can do is add up those individual uh, surface areas and add them all up to get the whole. To see what we're talking about most immediately, look at example 3. Example 3 is a surface that uh, is not simply defined. It's not given by just one uh, parametric representation nor with one simple equation uh, like of a paraboloid or anything like that. Rather, there are three components to it. Uh, you can see that there is a cylinder, x squared plus y squared. Uh, the bottom is a disk, a circle, uh, with uh, filled in x squared plus y squared less than or equal to 1 uh, on the plane z equals 0 and then there's a slanting top uh, which is a plane z equals 1 plus x and uh, that would of course lie above uh, that disk s sub 2 so right now we have three different surfaces that we'd have to work a surface integral out uh, we have uh, the surface integral of z ds. So what I'd like for us to do is immediately go back to the beginning of the notes to take a look at surface 1. Surface 1 is not easily defined by one simple equation. Uh, unlike, say, the plane which we'd have for surface 3. Surface 1, yes, it is a cylinder. Uh, we can definitely see that, but not a complete cylinder. Uh, you can see that, uh, you know, this is much like a can that is sliced off on a diagonal, and of course we have a, a solid surface up above, but this lateral area here is what S1 would really entail. So what do we have? S1, yes, it is x squared plus y squared equals 1. That is the area of or that is the equation of a cylinder, a circular cylinder. Uh, but there's also this other issue that, well, my goodness, uh, we have really just uh, not an entire cylinder, but just partially. Uh, you know, you can see the slicing off. So I'm going to say x, of course, could equal, with a radius of 1, cosine of theta. I'm also going to say y would be r sine of theta, 1 sine of theta. But remember there is a z component. Dare I say, let's let z simply equal z. And uh, if we were to do that, I do want to put in one additional uh, stipulation that z has boundaries in it, as theta does as well. z in this uh, surface for S1 you can see if we even drew a vertical bar on this uh, surface, you are going to always be between z equals zero. Uh, but what do we have up above? Well, we've got that plane 1 plus x, and uh, we could definitely work with those boundaries. Now, by the way, immediately we could say, well, we have a parametric form to represent this surface. I'm going to write it out in bracket notation, I think because it's going to work out a little bit more quickly. We have an i component of cosine of theta, a j component of sine of z, I'm um, sine of theta, I am sorry, and a k component of z itself. Notice what we've done. We have parameters of theta and z. And uh, it's at this point that I want to state that, you know, really this is a very difficult surface to represent otherwise. We don't have what we had spoken of earlier, uh, where we have z is equal to some equation g of x comma y. We don't have that most simply. 
Rather, we need to go back to the parametrics, the parametrics being right here. Uh, we now have a way to, to come back to the very first page of the notes and you can see where we need to go with this. We're going to have to take a cross product of those partial derivatives and uh, we'll do that very, very quickly. Uh, so as we would take a look at r sub theta, taking a derivative with respect to theta, you'd have negative sine of theta and uh, then cosine of theta, but the derivative of z with respect to theta is zero. Likewise, we'll take a derivative of r with respect to z, going back up here. The derivative of cosine with respect to z is zero. Sine of theta with respect to z is also a zero, and z itself is simply a one. Well, what exactly do we have now? Well, my goodness, we can take this cross product Dare I say, with all these zeros, and also a 1 in there, uh, let's immediately work this out by hand. Setting up our 3 by 3 determinant, we'll have negative sine of theta, cosine of theta, and 0. Uh, down here we have a 0, a 0, and a 1. And uh, just doing a real quick summary here we can say well look crossing out the top row and the i column 2 by 2 determinant cosine of theta times 1 well we could write this in bracket notation also and just say that's the cosine of theta remember the uh, j component will start off with a negative uh, but then we'd have negative sine of theta times 1 uh, and then uh, we'd also say minus is 0 so that's negative sine of theta but we put another negative out in front and we'll just get the sine of theta. Uh, and then for our k component, maybe that's the nicest one of all. Look at this, regardless of uh, which diagonal you're working with, you get a zero. Uh, we don't even have to worry about a plus or a minus, of course it still would be a plus. But look, we need to go and find the length of that cross product. And as we do, as we work this all out, you can see we'd have the square root of cosine squared plus sine squared plus zero. Well, that's just it, zero squared. Uh, sine squared plus cosine squared is one. The square root of one is one. Wow. Uh, where does that leave us? Well, this area of S1 is going to be a double integral of our function f Plugging in our parametrization of r with respect, of course, to theta and z. And then, of course, we multiply to that r of theta cross r of z in absolute value here. Uh, that magnitude, and this is dA. Well, we already know that this is 1. And uh, when we go back to our surface integral you can see that our function right here is z uh, so we're gonna have z in here now it's important for us to realize that uh, our parametrization is between theta and z so I could say dz d theta you see, the uh, parameters are always, always, always going to be tied into the integral bounds. And uh, because I've been uh, working with theta and z, I have to have my differentials being in that form. But you might wonder, well, what on earth are my bounds for z? Well, that's up here. Uh, but remember, everything is touching uh, the surface, and the parametrization is going to be fulfilled all throughout this problem both for the surface as well for the function uh, so we said x was uh, cosine of theta so my goodness what you have here is uh, 1 plus the cosine of theta for an upper bound 0 for the lower what about theta itself well as we're dealing with this cylinder of course, you could see that we're going to integrate between 0 and 2 pi. So, working this out most quickly uh, with a TI-89 to save us some time so we can finish up this video. 
you'd get 3 pi over 2. Okay, so that's all well and good, but let's be honest, that's just S1. Uh, let's take a look at another issue, namely S3. S3 is this plane. And uh, yes, it's off on a slant, and yes, we're only dealing with this oval partition of it. However, what I really, really, really want to call to your attention, I hope you can see it, is that Z is given to us as 1 plus X. My goodness, we can go back to the second page of the notes, which we have right here in box number 4 and say, my goodness, right now, I can work this out uh, with this uh, uh, square root of partial derivative of z with respect to x squared and so forth, that formula. Uh, wow. So we're comparing. The nice thing about this problem is that you're very quickly able to compare dealing with a problem where you are given the parametrization or you might even have to create a parametrization like we just did or where you're given a function z or y or x equaling some other uh, form so partial derivative of z with respect to x would be a 1 partial derivative of z with respect to y is of course a 0 and we could see that this integral was f of x comma y and then we could say well we could say z but that's like our g function that we had in terms of x and y and uh, then we would uh, multiply through by if you remember back it was the partial der derivative of z with respect to x squared plus the partial derivative of z with respect to y squared plus 1 and uh, we'll finish that up with a DA. Okay, so as we're working this out, what was our F? Our F was Z. But my goodness, Z, uh, even though this is going to be the function Z evaluated on this surface, the parametrization or function definitions are going to hold true from the surface, of course. So uh, we can say that z right here really we could write as 1 plus x kinda nice to have that then what the partial derivative of z with respect to x well that's just 1 that's 1 squared partial derivative of y with respect uh, z with respect to y is 0 and here's another plus 1 and uh, then of course you would realize we need a dx and a dy which uh, are going to be very very pertinent in just a moment this radical becomes root 2 but my goodness as you're looking at this I hope you're noticing that X and Y uh, were not given explicit boundaries uh, rather this is going back to the definition of working out a double integral uh, what I want to point out to you is we're going to be integrating over this boundary below, namely S2, that disk, uh, that's going to uh, determine our rectangular prisms when we work out this double integral. So as we're doing that, you might notice that it's more difficult to have boundaries treating this as a type 1 or a type 2 region. You might just want to instead immediately go to polar. Uh, and polar form, whenever you see circles, that's the way to attempt this problem. Remember that x uh, is always going to be represented by r uh, cosine of theta. I already took this radical and made it a root 2. But then we need an r dr d theta as well. And as we took a look at our r boundaries, on that base that we're integrating over for s2, we're going to be integrating between 0 and and 1. How about for theta? Well, we'd go between 0 and 2 pi. This would all work out, too, with the calculator, radical 2 pi. Now, S2 delightfully has z equals 0. So you're going to know that this double integral is going to work out because it's got a z. It has to equal 0. So that's delightful. Final answer, 
Just take your 3 pi over 2 plus root pi.